Uh, hello, everybody, wherever you are in the world, and welcome to day six of our marathon on uh, webinars in the Brain Awareness Week. You know, the Brain Awareness Week is certainly meant to alert the world public on aspects of brain research, also on deficits of brain research, and especially for the World Federation of Neurorehabilitation, we are, of course, dealing primarily with uh, brain repair in the sense that we try to do our best to repair the brain whenever necessary. And the brain is an important organ. The brain is a very soft organ. It's a very vulnerable organ and can be affected by a variety of uh, disturbances by traumas, by inflammation, by vascular accidents, and so forth. So brain repair certainly is an extremely important issue. I'm happy that we have three uh, very distinguished speakers uh, today. We will start with uh, Dr. Pova Barani. He was supposed to be with us yesterday, but we had some problems with that. So we have his talk today. And he's going to, uh, going to talk about his uh, experience, especially in the field of language disorders. He is one of the chairperson of the World Federation uh, uh, Neuro Rehab uh, Special Interest Group on Communication Disorders. Uh, Purva, it's a great pleasure to have you with us. And I think we could start with your talk. Thank you. So greetings from uh, Indore, India. I'm glad to be participating in Brain Awareness Week uh, on behalf of WFNR. And uh, the topic for me is uh, rehabilitation for persons with uh, aphasia. What is rehabilitation? It's a variety of cares which can help one to get back or to keep steady or to improve many abilities which are needed for daily life at home, at work, at leisure, during travel and hobby. Rehabilitation for persons with aphasia and disorders of speech and communication aims for many things. To be able to speak in all situations, to listen and understand, to participate in conversations at social events, reading, writing, arithmetic, with related cognitive facilities like memory, etc., and to have normal affect and mood, and to have normal family and social life. So that is the broad spectrum of rehabilitation. But there are many challenges. The most important challenge is treatment gap, and uh, that which means that the treatments are available to a varying degree of success, and yet they are not reaching the people who need it most. And uh, to reduce this uh, treatment gap, we need more awareness and education. Another reason is the lack of conviction and patience for the efficacy of speech therapy. Another reason for treatment gap is paucity of resources at the level of personnel, software, and hardware. And what is most uh, ironic is that the anguish, the desire, and the demand which should be there in the minds of stakeholders is missing. And all stakeholders, the persons with aphasia, their caregivers, and the care providers, uh, something is missing at that level. To continue with the challenges in aphasia rehabilitation, the nature of the problem itself is a big issue. The aphasia, because there are difficulties in diagnosis, in classification, you need a very detailed profiling and there is a need for more therapeutic research because of the heterogeneity and confounding variables as compared to many other neurological disorders and many other neurological disabilities, speech and communication are of a different nature. So what are the major steps in rehabilitation? Assessment, goal setting, therapies for restoration of lost abilities. Then we aim to work at environment around the person with aphasia and which includes communication partner training. We want to create aphasia friendly social environment. If we have reached or we think that we have reached the limits of restoration and even before that, we simultaneously are in a parallel manner work for adaptation which includes AAC, Alternative Augmentative Assistive Devices, and also simultaneously, we counsel the patient and family about acceptance of the situation, about coping skills, accepting the new normal, 
and yet eternal striving. So we keep on trying. Assessment is uh, time intensive, labor intensive. We pay attention to the severity of the condition, its clinical profile and syndrome. The profile can be impairment based, the profile can be functional based. Uh, we have to pay attention to other neurological and cognitive deficits, quality of life, psychosocial aspects, and also the status of caregivers. So, so many assessments, all of them are important input. I will not go into the details of clinical examination for aphasia, which includes auditory comprehension, articulation, fluency, repetition, naming, reading, and writing, and higher mental functions. And I will also emphasize that functional communication assessment is also important, which means performance of a patient on a diagnostic test battery uh, may not have very high correlation with this communication in daily life. Which diagnostic test battery? The ones which I enumerated a minute back. So what is more important here is to recognize that communication involves many other activities, role playing, give and take, pause and participate, listen and respond, gesture and writing. So all these are part of functional communication. They also need to be assessed. Similarly, quality of life, which particularly pays attention to psychosocial factors like loneliness, difficulty in making friends, reduction of the self-esteem, depression, and we also pay attention to bilingualism. In many countries, particularly in India, Bilingualism is rather deferred situation, except our uh, illiterate rural population. Most of the people who are educated to some extent and who are uh, living in uh, middle-sized cities, they are bilingual, multilingual. So we need to assess the speech and language function in all the languages. Another step is goal setting for rehabilitation. The goals have to be SMART. The acronym stands for specific, measurable, and meaningful achievable, realistic, and time-bound. The goals can be short-term, medium-term, and long-term, and they have to be set in collaboration with all the stakeholders. And goals are dependent on many things, the geographical location, the rest of the neurological status, the educational background, the languages, the intelligence. Something is uh, missing, as I was telling a few minutes back, felt need. I have seen, unfortunately, this in many patients in developing countries, that people are so unaware about their rights, that what can be achieved, that felt need is missing uh, in many families. So all these factors have an influence on the goal. The rehabilitation of person with aphasia is now improving because of better theoretical understanding of brain damage and recovery in neurobiological terms. Now we have a better grip on potential avenues for repair, replacement, and enhancement. And uh, here we say we want to restore. If we cannot restore, we look for compensation or reorganization. And this occurs at three levels, at the neural level, at cognitive level, and behavioral level. The loss can be permanent and remediable. And uh, what is remediable? There is a natural recovery and there is a recovery which is added by therapeutic intervention. And uh, when we come to the theory of speech therapy, we pay attention to principles of neuroplasticity, which includes uh, neurogenesis, synaptogenesis, strengthening of neural networks. So this better theoretical understanding at neurobiological level is now being supplemented by better theoretical understanding even at neuro-linguistic level, at the level of cognitive neuropsychology of language function, because of which now we have better validated tools to assess aphasia profile and the potential theory of recovery in aphasia is now being put to test so we can have a hypothesis whether this is the theory. If that theory is true, it should be amenable to testing in clinical medicine. So there are new methods of speech therapy being developed. The speech therapy is broadly of two types. One is holistic, which is uh, mainly a life participation approach. I will come to that in a minute. 
and the other part is impairment based in impairment based we go for a fine grained detailed analysis and profiling of the deficit of speech and communication function in a person with aphasia at various neuro linguistic levels at the level of phonology lexicon semantics uh, syntax pragmatics discourse reading writing so that is the impair we, we, we pinpoint the impairment on on a box and arrow model which is a theoretical conceptual model of speech and language function uh, which is known as cognitive neuropsychological model and if we localize the deficit at particular box and a particular arrow we call it impairment based having recognized the impairment we work on that the other is holistic which is life participation i will come to that in a minute the others are pharmacotherapy and non invasive brain stimulation pharmacotherapy has not been highly successful and pharmacotherapy alone has not been shown to be effective however pharmacotherapy in conjunction with speech language therapy may enhance the efficacy of the latter many molecules have been studied but i will not go into the details non invasive brain stimulation includes transcranial magnetic stimulation and transcranial uh, direct current stimulation and in the last 10 or 20 years there have been many smaller trials and some meta analysis which have shown promising results and positive results and uh, the principle of non invasive brain stimulation is such that uh, you either stimulate the left hemisphere if it's lesional so as to enhance the function of the area surrounding the lesion and sometimes you do a inhibitory stimulation of the contralateral or non dominant hemisphere because it has been shown that uh, the over activation of the non lesional right hemisphere may be having a inhibitory effect upon the recovery across corpus callosum so either you want to suppress the opposite hemisphere or you want to enhance uh, the activity of the perilesional cortex in the left cerebral hemisphere these are the two theoretical principles uh, for behind non invasive brain stimulation and of course this alone will not work it has to be coupled with traditional behavioral speech language therapy we in developing countries face uh, limited resources hence we resort to group therapy one therapist many patients we train family members as therapist we encourage physicians the medical doctors to play a role of a uh, therapist we use computers uh, information technology teletherapy our our confidence in teletherapy has enhanced because of corona pandemic and there are web based and also offline self practice tools i have created a, a collection of home based exercises for persons with aphasia as a part of speech therapy which can be administered by caregivers and we are in the process of creating a digital application for the same computers are playing a big role because uh, they can be done at the level of home and we can create large expanding collection of practice material which can be administered and multiple repetitions video conferencing can be arranged so these are the benefits of uh, computers and uh, in these are the tools of computers and information technology there are many commercial softwares which are available online and offline virtual speech therapy is possible so therapist can be an avatar on the screen and there can be lip sync speech while the patient is on the screen there can be teletherapy and uh, augmentative and assistive devices can be low tech and can be high tech which help a person with aphasia who has stopped improving bypass his uh, deficit there are talking photo albums there are alphabet boards there are uh, wordings for messages and images for messages uh there are facial expressions for the pain rating scales uh, uh to talk about the family members we can show this type of family tree diagrams uh, there are many many communication books available commercially and then we have to overcome the social phobia 
which is unfortunately rather common. There is an intense and recurring fear of social situations when the person is exposed to unknown people or potential assessment by others. So we have to encourage them to come out. And there uh, comes the role of family members and there comes the role of uh, framework for outcome measurement, which includes participation, change in the environment, change in the personnel around the patient. And uh, this is called life participation approach. This includes adopting a social model. So we always talk of medical model and social model of a disability in uh, ICF framework or WHO. So the social model is equally important it requires a philosophical shift from traditional medical model. It believes that communication is a social act and in a social approach, communication and psychosocial functioning are considered as inseparable. It focuses on communicative, physical, social, and emotional environment. Long-term personal consequences of aphasia are the focus of intervention and social approach and the ultimate aim of this approach, LPAA, life participation approach in aphasia, is to enhance the living of the life with aphasia. I often talk about uh, forgotten cog in the wheel of care and that forgotten cog is the carer or the significant other or the communication partner. And I have already been referring to their role in the therapy. So to recapitulate, what are the possible roles of caregivers? They are good communication partner, more so after training. They help in, we need to assess the burden and emotion and knowledge and attitude and practices of caregivers. Caregivers uh, are the person who we speak on behalf of person with aphasia. They are the link with the clinician. They are an ad and assistant in therapy. They become therapists themselves. They are participant in research. They act as an advocate for persons with aphasia. They act as leader in the patient support group. They are storytellers. We need stories of patients suffering from aphasia so that our awareness and motivation can improve. So we are paying a lot of attention to communication partner training. And I'm glad that I'm part of a international endeavor to develop modules in different Indian languages under the leadership of Yati Jackson, Isaacson from Denmark, and Caroline Jagoi from Dublin, Rebecca Palmer from UK, and uh, many more from other countries. So we are developing modules of communication partner training in Hindi, Uriya, Telugu, Malayalam, uh, in, and Indian English. And these are six hour modules which are administered in three hour, two sessions of three hour at a fortnight apart with a lot of health and reading material. And we hope that we will be able to enhance the skills of healthcare workers who happen to come in contact with persons with aphasia and also the friends and family members of persons with aphasia who are likely to come in contact with a person with aphasia. So these training modules will be quite helpful. So we say that aphasia is indeed a family affair. And uh, there are many strategies which we emphasize in communication partner training. We counsel them, the family members. We counsel them, you should have a slow rate of speech. You should have chunk of ideas with pauses in between. You should have simplified sentence structure, convey one idea at a time. So these are some of the highlights of communication partner training, which are administered with the help of videos and other things. Then we also train them on advocacy strategies so as to enhance the public awareness, so as to change the attitudes and behaviors, and so as to in, promote the inclusion of a person with aphasia in many social situations. Uh, and we should provide communication, ad and material, and we should advocate with the potential employers. We should say that this person with aphasia has recovered to this much extent and he should be put to employment. May not be as good as before, but employability is a part of advocacy efforts. So to conclude, uh, we have miles to go before the need to document 
current scenario about quality of life of persons with aphasia. There is some research, but we need to do more. Why there is a dearth of felt need for therapy and rehab? What are the psychological factors? What are the sociological factors? How can we improve the team approach for goal setting? How can we ensure that the reimbursement for expenses from medical insurance and from public sector hospitals in developing countries are, we need advocacy for that. How to impart communication partner training in group setting and uh, we should be more proficient in assessing and reducing the caregiver burden. We need to educate, as I was talking, potential employers, role of sheltered workshop. These are areas of workshop, uh, employment, uh, for persons with many type of disabilities, not only speech and language, what is the role of augmentative devices. We need to develop augmentative devices which are suitable to Indian languages and Indian cultural practices and role of occupation therapy in retraining these persons with aphasia for re-employment. So that would be the final goal of rehabilitation. So thank you very much for your kind attention. And that's all I have to say. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, nice to be resolved through aspects of aphasia and communication. Thank you, Emma. Training. Uh, let me give an address to the audience. Please use the question and answer box if you have questions to the, to the speakers or comments to the speakers. That makes it a little, more, a little more lively if you're interacting with us. Uh, let me ask the people on the panel here, Matilda and Evans. Uh, any questions to Apurva? Yes, um, actually, yes. So you mentioned, Dr. Apurva, that um, most people are bilingual. I would like to know how you address this in speech training. Do you choose one of the languages or do you train both or more? Yes, uh, we uh, talk to the patient and family. What is their priority to begin with? Mm -hmm. so they, the patients are very forthcoming. Occasionally, they may be confused, but usually they are clear in their mind. They say, I want therapy first in this language, which could either be the primary language, L1. Sometimes it can be L2, depending on the job and occupation and the professional life, because he wants to go to the job. So he might be more interested in L2 recovery rather than L1 recovery. So that can be variable. Ultimately, we should be able to, and we do try to give therapy in both are you are more than two languages. That is the ultimate aim. If we have the enough resources and if the patient and family are able to come, we ideally it should be both languages and we have some data and some evidence that there is a crossover benefit of therapy in one language to the other language. There is a crossover benefit of therapy in verbal domain to the reading writing domain. So there are significant crossover from one language to another. Thank you. Okay, Matilda? No questions, but I really think that this presentation brings back to earth. And while we, you, I'm usually working public health and we fly high, try to define the big lines. And then you go into this level of details, like having patients who are illiterate, having patients who don't speak the main language on which we are used to do the training, having caregivers that are not educated. And all of this, I think, is part of our working, not only, in the, as you say, in low- and middle-income countries. I, I think it belongs to all of us. Sometimes we forget. And you also have the issue of uh, access to treatment, which is also something that is really ethical in compared to having or not having the right for all to be treated. You brought so many topics. We could do another conference, uh, Professor Baranik, just on this. And I hope uh, there'll be opportunities with the WFNR. But thank you. I just wanted to, it was not a question. It was just a, an issue of reflecting on how much is important to speak together and to share experiences throughout the world. Thank you, WFNR and Professor Volker Homberg for allowing us also to learn so much from each other. Thank you so much. More than a pleasure. Let me uh, just uh, give some short comments. I think, first of all, uh, Apurva, I very, very much appreciate your uh, uh, your points concerning caregiver involvement. Uh, 
Uh, you know, we are just uh, planning a complete rolling out, so especially low middle income countries from the WFNR for education programs, maybe telecommunication and maybe whatever, by whatever means, which is primarily uh, uh, targeted to non-professional people so that we be the patient themselves, of course, and also, of course, caregivers and families. And I think that is a really of paramount importance. Uh, let me ask you two questions. Uh, um, one is concerning the applicability of the principle of forced use or constraint in use therapies in aphasia. Would you like to comment on this? Yes, yes. So uh, constraint induced uh, therapy concept came from motor constraint in hemiparesis and other situations. Uh, the same principle has been used in speech language rehabilitation. What happens? Many patients with aphasia they learn to communicate with the help of gestures and facial expressions and somehow they are able to carry on uh, sorry uh, I, am I audible? Yeah. hello am i audible yeah yeah, we can so, hear uh, yeah. so i was saying that uh, uh, we need to constrain the use of gestures and facial expressions and we emphasize use verbal mean, use verbal mean, speak, 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 use verbal mean. Because uh, to use non-verbal means is the easy way out. Mm -hmm. And we want to constrain that easy way out uh, during the phase of therapy, maybe for one month, two months, three months. Ultimately, in day-to-day -day life, when it comes to life participation, patient will use non-verbal means also. Uh, that can't be stopped and that need not be stopped. But as a part of therapy, constraint use... Uh, is important. Another thing related to is intensive. The word intensive in speech language therapy means, suppose your aim is to give 50 hours of therapy. Whether you will give those 50 hours over a period of three months or you will give it over a period of one month. It has been shown that if the same therapy is given in a lesser time, the results are better. So more intense the therapy, same hour of therapy in a lesser time is more effective. Okay, thanks for this comment. Uh, two more questions. One is related to what you mentioned, or briefly alluded to the pharmacological facilitation. Uh, what is in your hands the most favorable substance to use? I have been using in my practice, this is my anecdotal or personal experience. It is not evidence-based. I have been using serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs, in a gradually escalating dose. And I've also been using uh, uh, dopamine, uh, sorry, polynistrase inhibitors, the donepezil and revastigmine, these two agents. And sometimes I've been using paracetam. Sometimes I've been using dopaminergic agents like levodopa. Uh, so these are three or four agents out of which normally I use two. And it has been shown that if you give uh, SSRIs before the speech therapy session, and it improves the alertness and uh, orientation. And if you give the nootropic and uh, the dope, uh, do, the, uh, the donepezil group after the therapy, probably it works better. So that is my personal use. Okay. Uh, there is a question from the audience, how to deal with unethical people? That's a good question, of course, <laughs> everywhere. Do you want to comment on this? Uh, sorry, I didn't see. No, it was uh, the question is how to deal with unethical. Unethical. Yeah. Uh, I do not know uh, what does it mean uh, unethical. No, unethical can be many things. There are many. So this is probably more broad and a philosophical question. Uh, so I do not know whether I would be able to comment on on that or not. Uh, well, there may be unethical people. <laughs> have to well, yeah, they, are, they are in every walk of life, but uh, it's a more philosophical and behavioral question. Okay, let me ask you a, a final question. For a long time, there was an enthusiasm in using techniques, primarily, let's say, bringing the intact right hemisphere into play, for instance, by melodic intonation, uh, singing instead of speaking. Uh, do you use this? Yes. Uh, Yes, we do use music therapy. We do use melodic intonation therapy. 
the speech therapist, of course, I'm not the person who is giving the therapy, but uh, the SLPs who are part of my team and my colleagues in India, they have been using MIT uh, quite a bit, particularly in persons with non-fluent aphasia, Broca's aphasia, who know what they want to say, but the lexical retrieval is not coming. But because of their non-damaged right hemisphere, they are able to hum, they are able to sing a tune. And uh, then we uh, practice them a particular tune. And uh, then we put on the words, uh, what, what they want to say in their daily life. So small stock sentences, which will be often needed. Uh, we use those sentences with three or four words and we train them to, we, we want those words to piggyback on the rhyme, on the rhythm. Uh, that training is often helpful uh, to a modest degree so that they become more proficient in expressing their needs in daily life. Okay, thanks, Apoorva. If there are no further questions from the panel, Iris, Matoli, this is not the case. Thank you very much again, and we will proceed. Our next speaker is Professor Matilda Leonardi from, from Italy. She is an extremely experienced person in many fields, especially in pediatrics and disorders of consciousness, especially in public health. And she uh, is doing a very good job in helping the WFNR, sort of an ambassador in our interaction uh, with the World Health Organization. We are extremely happy, WFNR, WFN as well, uh, that even in the height of the pandemic, the WHO decided to be more and more interested also in non-communicable disorders, especially in epilepsy and other neurological disorders. And that is a major, I think a major step forward in the endeavors also of the WHO. So it's very a great pleasure, Matilda, to have you with us, especially uh, as this is your birthday today. So we are extremely grateful that you sacrificed the time for us instead of drinking champagne. So, uh, Matilda, the floor is yours. Thank you. I will also drink champagne. <laughs> I'm trying to uh, share screen so that I do presentation. Yeah. From beginning, from. Okay. Can you see full screen now? Yes. It seems okay. to. Work. Thank you so much. And um, thank you, WFNR, for celebrating the. Uh, Brain Awareness Week with this series of conferences. Thank you, Volker, for that. And um, to highlight in this Brain Awareness Week the issue that neurological disorders are really important. It has been said during this week by many, many colleagues and people, and I think that we all share the knowledge that uh, neurological diseases are very much present. We know that there are more than 400 neurological disorders. They are causing a lot of disability, and they are increasing worldwide because uh, the number of people with uh, surviving with the neurological disorders is increasing all over the world in high as well as in low and middle income countries. We know that there is this increase of diseases that is going to sort of facing uh, an enormous amount of uh, people from all ages, children, adults, as well as aging population with one or more neurological diseases just for mention, some of the most frequent are, in fact, for example, headaches, how many millions of people suffer of headaches? And they count to this burden very much, showing that uh, neurological diseases alone are the one of the leading cause of disability, and they are not receiving the level of attention that they need. We can see this starting already from the very first uh, numbers that WHO was providing to us in its atlas in 2004, which is now a lot of years ago, but already at that time, WHO was trying to raise awareness about the fact that the number of neurological beds is very low. Look at Africa. And uh, it's uh, really missing the number of uh, care that is needed for patients. So in all senses, if you are not counted, you don't count. And if you are not even with some services such as pediatric neurology, neurological rehabilitation, in a sense, it is as if the disease that you have is canceled from the scenario. And not for mention that in many countries, neuroradiology and other diagnostic tools are really lacking. And uh, stroke units are really in a low number in many, many countries. And the update of the ATAS or neurology 
the situation was still more or less the same. Spastic units are starting to increase and some epilepsy are starting to increase. However, as you see, for example, neurorehabilitation and uh, also neurological rehabilitation in general units is still very, very low. And the number of countries with these specialized services is really poor out of 105 countries uh, mapped and monitored by the WHO. Also, the workforce of neurology is low. And how can you provide good care and good treatment if those who have to think and care patients with neurological diseases are low? This is particularly true when we go in one of the main treatments for neurological diseases, which is rehabilitation. As you all know, and if you don't, please go and have a look in the Lancet. This paper from Alarcos, which was produced in December 2020, I think is uh, providing us uh, the base, the baseline on which we can uh, map our situation in our country. The need for rehabilitation and the presence of rehabilitation are creating sort of an enormous gap between the two. And in all this scenario, COVID. Uh, made the worst what was already very serious. Many neurological diseases got worse, as well as many new neurological diseases came out because of COVID. And this increase in neurological numbers is going to a call for enhancing care and services for mental, neurological, and substance use disorders. This has been said by WHO many times, not only because uh, the mental and neurological disorders are increasing, but also because there is an increased vulnerability and fragility of population. And I think living for many years with neurological disorders, I mean, as you've seen, is impacting not only on patients, but the previous speaker clearly showed it's impacting on the people near the patients, on the caregivers, families, and society at large. And uh, also COVID brought out something that we knew already from the atlas, but became very much clear. There has been an incredible disruption of services, more, mostly for some of the chronic diseases. The outpatients were disrupted. And the COVID was this feeling that certainly the situation got worse in countries where it was already bad. In 35% of uh, non-communicable disease services were disrupted during COVID. And in the assessment that WHO is regularly doing, what came out very clearly that uh, Already the situation was as such, only one in 10 people before COVID was receiving diagnosis, or only one in four people with epilepsy was receiving treatment, and also only one in three countries of the world is providing, for example, levodopa, that is the basic Parkinson drug uh, primary care. And these kind of numbers got all worse because of COVID. So treatment gap got worse during COVID, and the, the essential services providing this treatment also got worse. I think that the COVID was showing us new, with new glasses a situation that was already there. We all say building back, back better. Two days ago, the WHO was uh, proclaiming at the end of the pandemics, but how did, what did we learn and how did we improve? I mean, we increased maybe telehealth, that is one of the possible tools that can improve treatment for care. But have been, are we able to maintain availability of essential medicine? In many countries, after COVID, this is still not uh, possible. And have, be, have we been able to optimize health workforce capacity? This still is not the case for many, many countries. Despite we are in an era in which many theory of rights, of guidelines, of sustainability are coming out. And... Um, Still, despite this, in many primary care services worldwide, the lack of specialists is very low. And also the universal health coverage, you've been hearing from the previous speaker that many people have insurance problems and to cover the expenses, for example, for treatment such as rehabilitation. And uh, it is the increasing the need for non-specialists to be aware of the treatment that they can give. These gaping needs, is requiring many, many actions. First of all, maybe policy level advocacy and buy-in. Those of you who are listening from many parts of the world, and I thank you for listening on a Saturday afternoon, our WFNR series, I think you are all aware that you should learn how to advocate for your patient. And this is not easy, but I think that this learning is part of the capacity building so as to provide better care for patients all over the world. Also, the research gaps goes together. And um, there is a lot of areas that still can and should be explored. 
In this scenario, last year in May, the WHO approved and ratified with its uh, 197 countries the WHO Global Action Plan for epilepsy and other neurological disorders. Why epilepsy? Epilepsy is used as a, like a monitoring disease. If you are unable to provide diagnosis, treatment and care for epilepsy, how can you be able to really provide care for stroke, for example, more complex diseases, diseases that require even a more structured service organization? How do you build up things that are preventable? Stroke and stroke units worldwide are really still low. And how can you put together all the different things? The WHO gap was trying to say that starting from epilepsy and with the recommendation of the executive board, it is possible and it is feasible to have a plan that is involved in neurology as a whole. This global action plan on epilepsy, in fact, has been ratified last year with the commitment from those countries who have been ratifying it to take care of neurology and neurological patients. Ratifying a global action plan, it is important because it's a plan that is recognizing that neurology is a public health priority and that policy changes are needed to address the issue as well as it is a commitment at global, regional, and national levels. We at the WFNR are taking this commitment. We are thinking really that we can do something together for neurological diseases. We think that in these uh, objectives and action area, as you see, the diagnosis, treatment, and care is uh, the strategic objective number two, in which it is recommended to countries to improve care pathways to provide and to be sure that you provide medicine, diagnostic and health products like assistive device and all the prosthesis and other things that are useful to increase the capacity of people. Also to increase uh, the training for health workers able to provide better treatment and providing support to carers. I go back also to the previous speaker saying that it is part of the objectives of the WHO, and it is part of the action areas also to involve the caregivers into the improvement of uh, treatment and care of a neurological patient. To do this, of course, you need to have what WHO has, which is an integrated approach to neurological condition. Patients are not the disease that they have. However, you really need to have a clear mind in which pathway you have and you put to the patient. And the, the pathway should be First of all, having clear in mind that you can do promotion and prevention for neurological diseases and to avoid neurological diseases. Second, that diagnostic and treatment are part of this pathway across life course, involving all the different care systems, not only the health, but also the social, the employment, the education, as well as the whole setting of care system. And when rehabilitation at the end is not enough, you can still try to have and to build uh, palliative care as part of the pathways to improve care for patients with neurological diseases. So the integrated responses to neurological disorders that we are trying to achieve in responding to the WHO Global Action Plan is part of incre incrementing and implementing some of these areas. First of all, implementing international efforts and leadership, where we'll do some training, as um, Professor Holmberg has mentioned to you, to increase the, also the ability of our stakeholders to acquire global leadership in neurological uh, treatment diseases. And then access, this is something also uh, to diagnosis, treatment and care, capacity building, reduces stigma and strengthening health information system. All these are part of the strategic roadmap the WHO is designing for us. And we have until 2031 to reach this. We have specific steps that have been defined in the um, uh, pathway that WHO is providing to us. And the main recommendation is to integrate neurology in key public health policies. There are some global targets. And the target number one is uh, divided in, I'm just mentioning this. It is expected by this global action plan that by the 2031, 75% of countries will have adapted or updated national policies to include neurological disorders. As I mentioned, in many countries, neurological disorders are not even mentioned in public health. And this is providing a sort of uh, ignorance concerning what are the issues related to 
chronic diseases. Imagine in most of the young uh, countries with the young population, having children with neurological diseases which are neglected treatment and they don't go to school and then they will be unable to work just because the issue of neurological diseases and neurorehabilitation is not taken into account from early stage, it is something that is going to impact on future generation. Equally, when we speak about neurological diseases, we have to take into account that, in fact, what we do is we speak about brain health. Brain health is encompassing neurological disorders and mental health condition, and it is an overarching concept that has been um, uh, characterizing how we are going to work in the next year. We have to achieve a person-centered approach focusing on promotion, prevention, treatment, care, and rehabilitation. And this is the, uh, in fact, idea of what brain health is. We are working for brain health. Brain health doesn't mean the absence of diseases. Brain health means that despite the diseases you have with the treatment, you can reach and optimal brain development, cognitive health and well-being across life courses. This is the WHO approach to brain health. Then I think WFNR is entering into this brain health approach as, as part of marshalling treatment. So treatment is not only giving drugs or providing a treatment for the specific disease, but is a, the ability to have a broader approach to brain health by working on policies, by having an integrated approach to uh, brain health, as well as to foster increased investment and interagency collaboration. We try to work with this globally with partners at country level. And I just want to focus a bit on uh, the European Academy of Neurology, with whom I work and with whom the WFNR collaborates. In the WFNR, we of course have been um, uh, matching our ideas, but in the European Academy, we have been developing a brain health strategy that for the 47 European countries is going to impact because we are working with the national societies to improve this attention on neurological diseases. And of course, there is collaboration with the neurorehabilitation, which is part of our European Academy of Neurology brain health strategy. We have been taking into account all the issues that I just presented to you. And we also have been aware that in Europe, still, there is high stigma and discrimination of patients with neurological diseases, which got worse with COVID. There has been a lot of ethical issues. There was a question on ethics. There have been a lot of ethical issues in discriminating chronic and old people. And neurological patients have been suffering a lot during the COVID because the access to care for our patients has been neglected in many countries. But we know that neurological disorders can be prevented. We can prevent 25% of epilepsy, 40% of stroke, 40% of the dementia. We can treat them, stroke, multiple sclerosis, migraine, and sleep disorders can be treated. And most of all, we can rehabilitate most of the diseases. The approach we have in Europe is that one brain, one life, one approach is not centered on just one disease specific, but it is the idea that each of us, each of us professional working in the field can work in one or more of these areas of uh, the global action plan. And uh, what we can do here is that we can have an all-life approach, putting together international collaboration as well as uh, national strengthening and work through education and research. Care is, in fact, part of this. You, if you want uh, to have access to the paper, the paper and the strategy is published and can be used for many other areas of the world that want to get inspired. But I think brain health can contribute to global health. What we're saying is that neurology and neurorehabilitation should reach out all citizens, not only patients. To be able to speak about how much you can preserve your health by working on your brain health is really much, very much important because brain health is underestimated, undervalued, underfunded. If you think, and this is creating a treatment gap, if you think how much cardiologists have been able to do during the past 20 years, in terms of prevention, in terms of treatment, in terms of putting cardiology at the higher edge of health programs, I think that we should work the same for brain health. Because brain health, it is important because we need the, uh, to preserve what we can, even when people are aging, even when dementia is coming, still we can do something to promote brain health. And having brain health is essential to reach the sustainable development goal number three, that is the goal on health. I think that we in Europe are doing a 
brain health campaign and brain health strategy. But what we do is that we think that we are witnessing now by speaking about brain health and by trying to marshal treatment as part of this big strategy, we are trying to foresee a neurology revolution. This is the only revolution that is homocentric. We've been publishing with my friend and colleague, Mayova Ovalabi, that's also from Nigeria and the WFNR. We have been saying that um, the brain health uh, revolution, the neurology revolution is in fact uh, very clear to us because uh, the WHO Global Action Plan identifies the aim and the strategy for this global change in neurology that will affect brain health is health in general. And the aim of the WHO gap are very clear. The strategies to reach this goal are the key five pillars that can be shared by the international community. And this is why we're here today to speak together about this and to work together to reach brain health all together. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Matilda, for this very clear words on your nice birthday. We're grateful for that. Uh, you mentioned some very important points and uh, uh, you showed the activities of the European yes. Academy of Neurology very much. Let me make one point clear, and I think that is really essential in all of this bringing forward global action plans starting last year and we go until 2030. A very important aspect certainly is that we as clinicians, scientists, whatever we are, have to make politicians nervous, and we certainly have to alert them on this. So the political side of the medal is certainly very, very important. And what we advocate for everyone, arranging meetings or courses or whatever, make the politicians be part of it. Have at least a discussion with these guys. It's not always easy, I know, but nevertheless, it's important because decision makers on this field are probably at the end of the day more important than than the scientists and clinicians are. So that, that I can is, say, now yeah. if I can say something to this, I will say that each of the people that is listening today and is going to listen to this uh, recorded uh, presentation should have clear in mind that if you are non connected with patients' association then you will be weaker to speak with politicians. It is crucial. There are so many countries without patients' association. This is one of the roles we can have at country level. We can help patients' association to be created and formed. And together with patients, we can be listen better to politicians because they listen to citizens. So uh, my uh, sort of wish for today is that we are able to create many patients' associations. It is difficult. I know that in many countries like India, like African countries and Latin American countries, sometimes we are really missing patients' association, but I really am trustful that together we can create a larger neurological community able to claim better treatment and better diagnosis. Well, voters are always more important than scientists, that's for sure. Politicians make them nervous. On the other side, we have to consider that well, two-thirds of mankind are not living under democratic circumstances and are governed by authoritarian regime. And that, of course, make, doesn't make it easier. Or yeah. eventually it may make it easier, we'll see. So we certainly, depending on the, um, let's say, governmental structure and the times of regimes, uh, which are prevalent in one or the other country, the strategies must be different probably on that. Uh, let me briefly allude to the very important topic of pediatric neurology uh, in this field. I think if, if, if kids are most often forgotten and issues as childhood epilepsy or cerebral palsy are an extremely important part of worldwide neurorehabilitation. We are at the moment planning with our pediatric sick, and I think also with the help of Matilda, to bring up sort of a manual, an electronic manual, similarly to what we did for stroke two years ago, uh, which will be available free of charge worldwide, uh, to come up with some sort of delineation uh, of guidelines for pediatric uh, uh, rehabilitation or pediatric uh, therapies in general. We are just at the edge of starting this, but uh, I hope until the end of the year, we will have a clear delineation of this, which is a very important issue. I just want to mention that uh, Professor Wolfgang Grizzle, the president of the World Federation of Neurology, is joining us for this talk tomorrow. 
and he will uh, uh, also allude to the WMN strategy for, for brain health uh, in future. Okay, let me okay. have a look at the chat room. Uh, chat room. There's nothing new for Matilda. To the panel, Iris, Apova, any questions to Matilda? Or nice and nasty comments to Matilda? <laughs> No, thank you very uh -huh. much for, for a really passionate talk, uh, Matilda. I, I wondered, you mentioned that 20 countries signed, uh, ratified the, the global action. Does that come with any compulsory steps? No, but uh, it's a commitment. So the all the countries of the World Health Assembly, meaning all the 197 countries, they all agreed. There were no objection to this plan. So this is providing us a common ground on which we can go to politicians, to ministries of health, saying you ratified this, meaning that you approved, and now we can provide you with some hints to implement it. So there are specific targets, for example, like having at least one awareness campaign in every country by 2030. So this could be done, and the ministries of health ratified for that. So each of us, can go to his minister of health and show, or her minister of health, and show the what they ratified. And they said, what is your commitment? We should ask. I mean, if you don't knock the doors, and if you don't ask, sometimes you're not listening. So sometimes you're really together with our patient. This is what I usually do. I always knock the doors. Sometimes they don't open. But if they open, I think we have the global action plan that we can use as also guide for us, knowing what we can ask, how we can ask, and in time, the time in which we can ask. So it's it's also helpful for us. No, we definitely need the discourse and the approach to the decision makers and politicians by ourselves and, and also patient organization, NGOs, and so forth. Of course, that is absolutely mandatory. Okay, if there are no further questions, Matilda, thank you very, very much indeed. And have a nice rest of your birthday, by the way. Congratulations. From our thank side. you so much and bye-bye. Thank you so much. Okay, so our final speaker today uh, will be Professor Eris Bronner from uh, the University of Aarhus in Denmark. She is an extremely experienced uh, clinician in the field of uh, neurological rehabilitation and will allude a little bit to the uh, problem of how select treatments in, in neurological rehabilitation. Eris, thank you very much for joining us and the floor is yours. Physiotherapist and associate professor at Hamel Neuro Center and Aarhus University in Denmark. This presentation refers mainly to motor rehabilitation and mainly to stroke, because here we have the most data and this is my background. However, it can also to some degree be applied to other acquired brain injuries, such as traumatic brain injury. So I would want I want to talk about evidence-based neurorehabilitation, why we need it, uh, about the importance of prognosis and present some of the evidence in the subacute and chronic phase and uh, complete with uh, some suggestions to where we go from here. So many of you will have seen this image before. It includes the best available scientific evidence at a certain point in time. And I, I would want to add prediction to it because it is also part of the best scientific evidence. And it also includes clinical experience from uh, all clinicians um, in choosing the right, uh, the best available evidence where it is uh, available and maybe also in applying uh, treatment approaches where we don't have evidence yet. And of course, it is based on the patient's preferences and, and values. So why should we apply evidence-based practice? Well, basically to achieve the best possible function and thus the best possible quality of life for the, for the patient. And we also have the obligation to try to fully exploit the patient's rehabilitation potential. We will meet increasing demands in times of limited resources in the future with the aging population and there will more people that need rehabilitation services and there will not be more clinicians that can provide rehabilitation services. And of course, we want to offer the best rehabilitation at the right point in time after stroke. 
the target is to to provide personalized rehabilitation and I wrote here in brackets even more personalized rehabilitation because any any therapist would claim that he or she already provides personal personalized rehabilitation. So the question is what type of training works for whom at what time after stroke? And the most important factor is the initial, initial impairment. And this is the basis for the type of treatment that can be offered. As we know from motor learning research, at any level of impairment, the training provided should be meaningful, motivating, challenging, and if possible, active with many varied repetition. The complexity of impairment, however, can make it difficult to, to uh, to address the different challenges at the right level and with a meaningful dose. For example, can cognitive problems uh, limit the ability to, to engage in training or fatigue can hamper, can hamper motivation and can, can reduce the, the individual motivation to participate in training. And of course, pre-existing comorbidities can be an obstacle for training. And uh, the individual prognosis can be a guidance for the type of training that we and, and we should use prediction models where they are available. This is the definition of the uh, phases after stroke as suggested by the stroke rehabilitation and recovery round table where the Early, uh, the acute phase lasts up to seven, seven days, the early subacute day phase from seven days to three months, and the late subacute phase from three to six months, and afterwards the, the chronic phase. And during these early weeks after stroke, the endogenous plasticity is heightened. The probability to create new networks that can compensate for damaged networks is substantially larger than later on. And that does not mean that function cannot improve at a later stage, but it is harder and it's more on an activity level by exploiting underlying function than on an impairment level. So prediction can be important to choose the right treatment plan. And this is because there is this limited window of opportunity after stroke, but we also face limited resources of rehabilitation services, such as the length of stay, the staffing levels, and probably equipment at some places. And there are also limited resources on the patient side. In the subacute phase, there is a uh, substantial stress, psychological strain, and uh, many patients have many impairments to address. Uh, they suffer from fatigue, so it, it can be difficult to find the right treatment plan and to find the right focus for the limited time of a rehabilitation stay. Prediction helps to focus on relevant treatment, and it also helps to adjust the patient's and the relative's expectations. Several prediction models for upper limb motor function after stroke have been suggested. The uh, uh, best known is probably the proportional recovery rule, which state, states that most patients will regain around 70% of their maximal possible improvement. It has been extended to gait function and neglect, and it has also been much debated and criticized for statistical flaws and defended again. However, a main shortcoming always was that there seems to be a substantial number of so-called outliers who do not follow the 70% rule. And these are the people with severe paresis or paralysis after stroke. Nyland and colleagues identified early finger extension as the most important predictor of upper limb function six months after stroke. However, they only differentiated between people who will achieve some function and those who will not. And some, uh, another Dutch research group developed a computerized model with a huge advantage that measurements can be performed throughout the course of recovery and are not dependent on fixed time points after stroke. However, there is a quite high prediction uncertainty, especially for the first three months where we need prediction the most.
And this figure shows the PREP2 algorithm developed by Casey Stenier and her group in New Zealand. It is the most clinically applicable model because it contains four categories and it's thus much more differentiated than other models. And it also provides guidance for the patients with most uncertainty, those with severe upper limb impairment. It is based on a simple clinical score, the same as applied by Nyland and colleagues. It's a safe score, shoulder abduction and finger extension. And patients who achieve a, a, a score of five or more on, on SAFE and are very likely to uh, achieve excellent or good motor function. For patients who are below the score of five, uh, an, an extra examination is applied at transcranial magnetic stimulation to establish the integrity of the corticospinal tract. If there is a sign of some integrity of the corticospinal tract, that is, if it is possible to elicit an action potential, then the patient still have a chance of a good recovery. If not, they are very likely to achieve only a very, very limited or poor recovery. So for most patients, the initial upper limb function, initial that is the first uh, few days, uh, will tell us a lot about future, future arm function. But for patients with par paralysis or severe paresis, it's very difficult to predict what levels of function they will achieve based on clinical tests alone. And for these patients, transcranial magnetic stimulation can be a valuable tool to increase the accuracy, accuracy of prediction. And as mentioned, it assesses the corticospinal tract integrity by inducing an electric current that again induces a weak mag magnetic field to the skull. And then a signal is sent to the muscles in the arm and hand and registered with EMG. And if it's possible to evoke uh, a signal, to evoke a, a potential, then the patients are classified as MEP plus, and if not, uh, MEP minus, and thus have a very, very poor prognosis. But how reliable is the prediction from TMS and, and clinical tests? Well, Stinier and her group found that the PrEP algorithm as a, as a whole correctly predicted the prim primary clinical outcome, which was the action research arm test in 80% of the patients. And our own data from 2020 suggests that we, uh, our patients had a correct prediction rate of poor outcome in 78% of all patients when the PrEP algorithm was applied two weeks after stroke. And some newer data that we collected during the last two years also showed that only one out of seven, 16 percent with poor prediction according to TMS, that is uh, MAP minus, improved more than six points on action research arm tests three months after stroke. We also found that the probability to reach at least some function was 29.4 times higher for patients with at least some corticospinal tract integrity. But back to treatment. Plum and Jones summarized in their seminal paper these key features for experience dependent plasticity that should be integrated in any training after stroke whenever possible. Like muscles, brain networks that are not used deteriorate. And if brain networks are ir irreparably damaged, input to the brain is the only way to stimulate the creation of new co connections. Several aspects of intensity should be considered. Tasks should be challenging, not stereotype repetitions, but always adapted to the appropriate level of difficulty. To learn new skills or relearn old skills, we have to be cognitively engaged. Technology can help. Many VR systems and robotic systems incorporate an automatic adaption of the level of difficulty and motivating gamified training to reach more repetitions as was, would be possible with standard therapy. And another aspect of intensity is cardiovascular intensity. A few words about repetitions and motivation. Several studies have been published in which the authors conclude that patients with acquired brain injuries are very little active during their rehabilitation stay. Maybe best known Julie Bernhardt's 2004 study with the title Inactive and Alone, 
where they assessed physical activity during the first two weeks after stroke. They found that during the therapeutic day, patients spent more than 50% resting in bed, 28% sitting out of bed, and only 13% in therapeutic activity. These reports of relative inactivity were confirmed by other studies. Technology-assisted rehabilitation can be a means of providing higher intensity of training. When we were looking at the number of repetitions of arm movements during the course of a rehabilitation session some years ago, we observed that patients in the group that trained with the VR system achieved a significantly larger number of repetitions. This was especially the case for patients with severe paresis. This figure shows in blue all patients with re who trained with virtual reality and the patients who trained with conventional training. We saw that patients who trained with virtual reality reached a higher activity rate, roughly 10% more than patients in the control condition during a training session. And this difference was significant. However, when looking at the subgroup of patients with mild to moderate paresis here in green and severe paresis, it became obvious that the difference could be attributed to, to the patients with severe paresis who trained roughly more, 20% more in the virtual reality group compared to the severely impaired patients who trained conventionally. And this is also reflected in the average active time in minutes, much larger in virtual reality than in control, and the total time they spent in, in training. So is more better? Well, yes, basically, basically yes. There is uh, quite strong evidence from Verbeck and colleagues that uh, physical therapy interventions that favor high intensity and repetitive task oriented and task specific training are more effective than those who uh, provide uh, standard training or less intensive training. And according to Schneider and Lose and, and their colleagues, it looks as even if uh, increasing the amount of usual rehabilitation improves activity after stroke and that treatment groups that receive more improve more. However, increased intensity does not necessarily result in better function. As several studies uh, demonstrated, um, also our own virtues trial where we compared virtual reality training to conventional rehabilitation and as I just showed, um, the patients were much more active in the virtual reality condition, but this did not translate to increased function as compared to the control condition. Carolee Winston conducted a huge uh, trial with 361 patients where three groups received training for upper limb functions. One of the group uh, has received a special concept, including motivational strategies, the Accelerated Skill Acquisition Program, ASAP. The second group received dose matched standard training, and uh, the third group received less intensive treatment. The endpoint was the Action Research arm tests 12 months after stroke, and they could not find a difference for or between any of the groups. However, the group in, who engaged in the ASAP program reported an increased use of the affected arm and hand. Uh, Rogers and colleagues conducted a large robot study in, in Great Britain with the in-motion device. And they also had three groups, an extended dose of standard training, the robot training, and uh, uh, just standard training only. And also here, there was no difference between the groups and no difference between any subgroup analysis. Uh, the last study is by Nava and, and colleagues where they compared uh, intensive uh, gait training to a relaxation approach. And also here, they could not find a difference between the groups. As many of you know, it is very difficult to show an effect of whatever treatment in the subacute phase after stroke, as much of the improvement can be attributed to spontaneous biological recovery. So there is obviously a need to discuss what high intensity means, what type of intensity for which function and for which patient, and how this realistically can be achieved for the individual. 
because usually the doses that are provided to humans are much lower than the doses that were provided in animal studies. Nevertheless, there is converging evidence that high intensity gait training that focuses on increasing the heart rate and the number of steps leads to better gait and mobility than standard training, as, shown, as the studies shown on this slide demonstrated. In a sample of subacute patients with stroke, Henderson and colleagues demonstrated that the focus on stepping practice, taking as many steps as possible, forward, backward, sideways, on stairs, with weight or without, resulted in faster gait, a longer gait distance, and also non-locomotor outcomes such as balance improved. Another cohort study from Norway by Moore and colleagues came to the similar results. Klaassen and colleagues compared three groups in a randomized controlled multicenter trial. The first group received standard training. Uh, group two received high intensity gait training for five hours a week. And group three doubled the dose, 10 hours a week. Interestingly, both uh, high intensity gait training groups did not differ significantly from each other, but were much better than the standard training. Thus, it seems that a lower dose of high-intensity gait training may be sufficient to induce improvement in walking function and that the improvement is retained after one year. This type of intervention could be provided with normal staffing levels in the high-intensity group that received a lower dose. Intensive training can also in the chronic phase result in better function. Nick Ward and colleagues showed with their uh, with their study from the Queen Square program that patients who were on average 18 months after stroke improved significantly when they had participated in, in their upper limb training program for 30 hours per week for three weeks, in total 90 hours. And the patients improved their arm motor function and the improvement lasted for six months. However, it has to be mentioned that these patients had some upper limb function to start with. They were not completely paralytic. So how can we support the brains that need repair? I want to make the following suggestions. Personalized neurorehabilitation. Personalized neurorehabilitation based on individual prognosis and preferences. And this is not only desirable, but also a necessity in times of limited resources. We have already prediction tools that are quite reliable in some areas of function. If we with high certainty can tell that a person will not achieve any meaningful arm function, we should put more effort in other areas of function such as gait training or language training during the few weeks that they are admitted to rehabilitation. Secondly, implementation of evidence-based practice. The transfer from research to clinical practice still takes too much time. There have been tremendous efforts to boost this transfer, such as the clinical pathways books and webinars, summer schools. But we also have to think of a variety of formats that can reach a broad audience. And we should focus much more on implementation research. Thirdly, the long-term perspective. Many people have to live with lasting disabilities after stroke and other acquired brain injuries. A long-term perspective on rehabilitation, which also targets to avoid deterioration of function, could encompass a combination of rehabilitative and assistive devices, for example, brain-computer interfaces in combination with soft robotics or EMG-controlled assistive devices. We should also consider rehabilitation booster stays to maintain function and to avoid deterioration in the chronic phase after acquired brain injury. Another important aspect here would be the secondary prevention. And lastly, the preparedness on a, at a societal level. Health policies that take into account future challenges in both developed and developing countries and are prepared in terms of flexible structures and technologies and here preferably low cost technologies that are available for more or less everybody and maybe also tele rehabilitation strategies where patients can engage in more rehabilitation at home, um, sometimes remotely connected with others. So I hope we can prepare new rehabilitation for current and future challenges. Thank you. Okay, uh, it's very, very 
many thanks to this very uh, comprehensive and uh, let's say clear talk, making a lot of interesting points uh, in this. Let me first look at the at the question answering of the audience. There was one question uh, in our uh, proprioceptive loading of the affected limb, which has been a practice is still necessary in promoting motor and functional recovery. Yeah. Do you want to answer this? Um, I have to. I have to admit that I'm not quite sure what proprioceptive yes. loading is. Well, I have the same problem. So we, we probably have to clarify that a little bit uh, later. So let me uh, open that to the to uh, at least to the panel here. Matilda, any questions or comments to what Aris said? No. Oh. Uh, no, thank you. Thank you, Iris. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Purva. Okay, I don't know if it's not. Uh, well, there is, I think there are a lot of epistemological questions, uh, of course, arising from what you've said. When we look back, let's say the last 20 years or so, or longer, even not 20 years, we have an increasing number of very good, well done papers in the field, that's especially motor rehabilitation, a little bit less than language a little bit lesser even in uh, 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 language rehabilitation. But so far, we must be serious about that, that we really do not have game changers. Okay? Mm. We, we have a lot of studies going on, a lot of PhD programs are running for that. That's fine, that's okay. But nevertheless, the question is, are we really asking asking the right questions and are we conducting the right trials and i think that is a very serious problem because there's a lot of money millions of hundreds of millions of dollars uh, which are invested into this but nevertheless except for constraint induced movement therapy and some we don't have real game changers mm. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And this is really frustrating, especially for motor function. But um, I think this may be really mainly due to the huge amount of spontaneous biological recovery that makes it so difficult to show a, a decent effect size of wh whatever intervention we provide. And I think one solution could be to get a little bit closer to that to stratify patients much better than we did and I mean, it's it's always very challenging to recruit enough patients within a certain time frame, and then you widen your inclusion criteria, and then you you end up with a totally heterogeneous sample, and, uh, and not a result that can be useful for for anything. That's right. But uh, what I mentioned, I think we are probably not always addressing the right questions. I give you an example. You mentioned Prabhakaran's uh, and. Uh, 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 Krakow's work on, on proportional recovery, and we know that it's not only pertinent for motor, that it's similar in neglect and similar in aphasia mm -hmm. rehabilitation. We do not know yet the neurobiological underpinnings of this, but there seems to be a general, uh, uh, let's say, rule within the system, which we have not understood properly uh, so far. And what it means is that irrespective of what you do, you, you, you will recover to 70%. Mm. And Therefore, this is not really helpful for marshalling or selecting treatments. Also, when you look at Kathy's work with the PrEP algorithm and all this, that's fine. You have a good prediction that people have uh, army reduction and finger extension will do better, especially if they have intact corticospinal efferents available. Does this mean that we should treat them? Or does this mean that's fine, let them go, even in the absence uh, of any rehabilitation? And we haven't solved that yet. i give you one example, and I think that is very important. You, you also alluded to that. For those severely impaired patients who have a fugal mire in the order of 11 to 22 or something like this, more or less plagic, what are we doing with these guys? We do not even know. We have some some soft signals that these people may benefit from higher intensity treatment, provided we can keep the motivation up. 
but we have never really shown that. Mm. Most of the studies are, and people are much, much better. Right? Do much, much better than Google My 44 and plus. Right? And well, that is not a big deal. They, they, they are moving and you can lose, use motor learning strategies, improving their trajectories, move them more efficient, faster, with more force, whatever. But those poor guys who don't move at all, the question still remains what we can do with them. Do you want yeah, to it's 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 very very difficult to to achieve a substantial amount of intensity with those patients and i think yeah, that's what, what i also tried to um to to tell that maybe for some of them technology can be a help but it is very likely that we in most cases will not come close to a dose that could make a change and th this is a real challenge because our patients are not rats they have complex lesions, they have not a, a specified uh, cortical lesion only, and they have their comorbidities and all kinds of other challenges. And I experience that daily, how difficult it can be to, to address these different challenges in, in the context of all the stress that they, uh, that they are under. But I, I think here it's really, really critical that we choose the, the areas of function where we can expect a, at least some recovery and, and not waste our time with uh, giving a, a person a, a mirror and to train with mirror therapy for hours when we, when we with really high certainty can tell. And that's what we know at the moment. If the corticospinal tract is lesioned, there is unfortunately uh, in 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 most cases, almost all cases, no chance of recovering any upper limb function. That's right. Well, but we are missing studies, really, uh, which would show that high intensity treatment, let's say five hours a day or something like this, would be helpful in changing the proportional recovery in those patients with severe paresis. We, we don't have studies on this. It's never known. And that, that is certainly a problem. Mm. We are talking about that all the time, although we are not, that, that's my point, that we are not planning the appropriate trials uh, to find that out. Mm. I think it, it looks a bit better for gait function, actually. So there is is really, maybe there is some chance that we go beyond spontaneous biological recovery by providing more intensity. Absolutely, but the plegic arm certainly is the, the primary problem. Mm. No to rehabilitation, at least. There is a clarification, as far as I can see, from the chat room concerning the pro 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 proprioceptive loading. So, Cole, uh, I suddenly writes, by, in, in, by proprioceptive loading, I simply want to speak about putting weight on the affected limb to promote joint approximation, which is believed to facilitate proprioceptive firing. This is because it has been argued that the slow rate of recovery seen in the upper limb is partly due to the fact that it's non-weight, that it's non-weight unlike the, uh, uh, yeah, that, that's on the weight-bearing aspect. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm. Yeah, well, I, I just know that weight are, are frequently used in high intensity gait training and there seems to be some effect so it, it it's at least one tool in the tool case to use it that is perfect right it's a part of the the toolbox we have available mm -hmm. and that alludes of course to to power training after stroke mm -hmm. you know, power training is used extensively in lower uh, in, in uh, peripheral uh, neurological problems with uh, uh, disorders of the lower motor neuron uh, after injuries or whatever have you. Uh, but it is also, and it has been shown in many studies, uh, that, that uh, power training, force training, can be useful also in upper motor neuron lesions. That, that's probably that's what, what mm. it's alluding to. Okay, any further comments? Let me see if there's anything back from the question offer. Not, not really. Okay. Uh, Apurva, any questions to Eris? One comment. Uh, uh, sorry, I was uh, not here for a few minutes uh, because of some personal uh, <clears throat> problem. Uh, my clinic and my office and my home is same premises. So I missed uh, uh, the talk partly. 
regarding Matilde is a neuro, I, I was very happy to hear the word neurology revolution. Uh, that is so uh, glorifying, self-glorifying. And it is true that we are making progress in that direction. But just one uh, comment that there is an element of neuron envy also, parallel to neurology revolution. The neuron envy or neurology envy comes from other sciences and from social sciences. They say that we, the neuroscientists, are trying to reduce human beings in terms of human brain only. Now, that's just an off-the-cuff remark. It is not really pertaining to the gist of your presentation, but just a stray thought which came to my mind. Mm -hmm. Can I answer to this? I uh, believe that we, we adopted the biopsychosocial model many years ago. And within the biopsychosocial model, of course, you cannot live without your brain. In fact, I can also say that I love you from the deep of my brain because it's there where everything lies and stays. But the real approach that is the correct one for the neurological disorder is not a competition between professionals, but it is an interaction. Mm. Because the biopsychosocial requires good diagnosis and good treatment by neurologists, but also it requires good psychological approach as well as good social interaction. We are not taking everything. We want that our patient can get the best they can. And if I can just say something concerning what you mentioned, you mentioned the insurance. Most of the countries of the world, they don't have public health. They have a private health based on money. So if you're rich, you get treated. If you're poor, you get nothing if not the love of your family. I think this is some priority in which we have to speak, which is far beyond being the property of brain. If your social people that complain want to fight with us, for getting more care for all the patients, we'll be more than welcome to have them with us in fighting for our patients. Yes. Uh, thanks, thanks for the comment. I think we always have to keep in mind that we are treating patients and the brains. Uh, uh, that, that is an important issue. And a patient with the brain, of course, is embedded in all sorts of yes. yeah. uh, uh, social uh, and, other, and, and other structures. Uh, first of all, we, we, we don't know very well how to treat brains at all. That, to be honest, we have to be very modest in this respect as we do not understand uh, uh, most of what probably in future would be important. Let me make a final comment. I would like to hear your response to that. The, the, the question is, for years now, at least two decades, we are very much admiring uh, the concept of evidence-based medicine with a Cochranian way of putting data together into meta-analyses or whatever have you. The question is, and I want to be a little bit provocative in this respect, uh, the question is if this is really the royal way of inventing uh, new techniques and new strategies. And my gut feeling is it is not because the idea of this data collection, which is deeply embedded into the Ukrainian thinking, uh, of course, precludes to come up with completely new. And we should think about that. I think we need also an opening up of our epistemology uh, in, in, if we want really to create new uh, let's see new avenues or find new avenues for treatment. I, I would like to hear your comments on this. this, this I, I deliberately be provocative in this respect. <laughs> well, if, if we only would go after Cochranean evidence, we wouldn't be able to do anything because most Cochrane reviews end with a conclusion that they cannot conclude uh, anything more or less. More trials are needed. Yeah, more trials are needed, but but nevertheless, I, I mean, we have some evidence, and where we have this evidence, we should not just ignore it if Cochranian or or not. So I think that we and we have to have some quality criteria, and this is what what Cochrane represents. Yeah, right, right, that's so right. Of course, they should probably they should, we should find other designs, and we should look more at patient reported outcome measures um, that that could be an alternative. Definitely. And we have to do better studies. We have to stratify our patients. We have to ask the patients what is important to them. So that's to the biopsychosocial perspective. I think nobody 
would want to reduce patients on brains and neurons and synapses. And um, yeah, so that's that's the main point. I mean, we have to we have to do better trials. Nothing to add to Iris. Fully agree <laughs> on everything she said. Iris, that was a good, very good closing statement. Apoorva, any any further comment on this? Uh, I fully agree that there is a world beyond Cochrane and that includes uh, patient-centered approaches, that includes qualitative research in addition to quantitative research, that includes observational studies. You may call them a low level of evidence, but they are very important, uh, non-randomized and non-blinded. So all sorts of evidence are adding up and they are really important. I think it's a very important issue to think how good ideas arise. And when, when, when you look, for instance, historically, if you look at uh, constraint induced movement therapy, when that talk uh, started that, uh, it, it came out of a sudden that he could not do his animal work with monkeys anymore. And then he immediately went to patient and it worked, right? So mm -hmm. this was not something originated from a Cochranian type of thinking. It was just doing it. <laughs> and I think that's important to, to have in mind. Okay, if there are no further questions, comments, nothing. Okay, so Matilda, nice rest of your birthday, that's for sure. Thank all of you for joining us uh, today. A special thanks again Thank to Christian. Uh, Christian is the guy in the background who makes all of this te technically possible. Thanks a lot, Christian. Again, we see you. Uh, I hope we see all of you tomorrow, same time. We will have sort of a comprehensive uh, uh, end up closure of the Brain Awareness Week. Uh, and uh, we look forward that we will have good discussions. Most of the speakers of this week will be present and uh, we will see uh, how far we get from that. Thank you very much. Have a nice rest of this session. Thank you very Bye -bye. much. Bye -bye.